welcome to episode four of the Celtic Minded Podcast. I'm Frank and he's Tommy. We've got a wee prop the day. It's a wee glass. And as you can see, some people will say, that glass is half empty. And others will say, that glass is half full. Frank, we were happy during episode three of the podcast. We were energised by the six victories in the spin, the 24 goals, the, the four clean sheets. We were enthused by the style of play. Big Ange had us at the edge of your seat and we were smiling throughout it. We now have a podcast on the day of a new month and on the back of two defeats, two away defeats, one to AZ Altmark and one to the Rangers. Is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? For me, it's half full. Um, I thought uh, against the uh, European game with Alksa, um, I thought um, we, uh, we get through there and uh, that's the most important thing in Europe to get through. I thought against Rangers, um, Celtic defensively were at their best I've seen this season and only a really good goal by Rangers from a set piece. Um, it was well defended for me. I looked at it. It was well defended and it was a good header from the Rangers player. But Kyoko, Kyoto just missed the opportunity when he was through to square the ball for a certain goal. And um, that's the first mistake I've seen him make. So that's not a problem. But Celtic had chances with Edward had a very good chance as well. So I think Celtic, although they have been beaten in the last two games, um, I don't see any problems. I think uh, I think Celtic are still going ahead. Um, it's going to take the manager two years to three years to sort out the defence and sort out the team. And I see that he's been buying a lot of players there in the window. And uh, I'm, I trust I trust the manager. And I think he's doing a great job. And for me, that glass is half full. Brilliant, Frank. I'm, I'm glad you've said that, that there's loads to discuss in this episode because we, we do have to discuss Europe. We do have to discuss the Rangers game. And then we do have to discuss the whole transfer window and the dealings in the market. And I also want to then come to you from the point of view of leaving the club because you, you had an experience leaving the club and I want to get your experience around that because I, I've heard you talk about it before and I, it wasn't a very good episode I think but I, w- I, want, to, I want to get your, your spin on that because or your, your opinion on that because it's important to hear what you've got to say. So from, from the European point of view uh, to start with, uh, Jekyll and Hyde is what I would say was the performance because you look at the first half um, and we, we scored a brilliant goal a fantastic goal, what a break, great pass for, for Alston, great uh, bit of pace and, by, and energy by Abada, fantastic uh, uh, ball across the box and uh, uh, Kyogo uh, puts it away with a plum. So absolutely brilliant. And then we have a ridiculous goal um, and people have tried to talk about uh, sharing the blame between Welsh and, and Big Joe Hart. It wasn't even nothing to do with Welsh, it comes off Welsh's shoulder but it's, it's, it's Hart's ball every day of the week. And Big Joe, for some reason, I don't know whether he's blindsided or something, but he doesn't see the forward coming in. He doesn't come out fast enough and they end up getting a, a free goal. <laughs> and then, what do we do for a cross ball? They get a second free goal. I mean, what the staff felt doing with that one? I mean, goodness, Frank, he's got to adjust his feet. The ball, it's not as if it's, it's came to him a short distance. It's came from the wing. He can see it coming. He doesn't adjust his feet. He swings at it and misses and it hits the other foot and goes in. So if you think about it, Frank, we gave him two goals. However, Jekyll and Hyde, second half, I'm sitting watching it and I'm probably the same as you. I thought we were out. I thought they're, they're going to come at us. They're going to score another goal. It's going to go to extra time. We're going to be out. I thought we defended brilliantly in the second half. Uh, and I think bringing on Eddie... Um, gave us an outlet that we didn't have um, and, and maybe in the first half but I think the defensive performances of Starfelt who he's you know some people have given him a, a lot of stick here's a bit of character you know it yourself right. Right. see yeah. if you make a big mistake during the game surely the big issue is 
can you keep playing? Can you keep going despite the fact you've made a big mistake? Yeah, I think it's I think it's very important. Um, Any time that I made a mistake um, on a football park, I, I remember against Aberdeen, I missed a complete and utter sitter up at Petodre, and you couldn't get a worse sitter than that. And after that, I made I get man in the match in the game in the one three one, and I was involved with all the goals. Now that's what he's done. He's used that negative and put it into a positive, and I was, I think that was absolutely brilliant what he done. And I thought if Celtic would score a goal in the game, the game was over, and I was right. Although uh, it did look as though uh, it would be a tough night, but all, all European games are tough. Um, they came, the most important thing they came through it. And for me, the big plus is they defended well. Definitely. Frank, at the end of the day, qualifying was the aim, right? Was the, the, the result on the night was largely irrelevant as long as we went through. Um, and I, the boy in Montgomery come on, uh, young Adam Montgomery, I thought he had a very good game in the left. And again, Ralston and Welsh. I mean, they, these boys are just growing in stature every game. Uh, they, they're, they're tackling, um, they're, their commitment, determination, everything that you would want for a Celtic player. They, they're, they're displaying it in spades. And therefore, I, I thought it was a, a great game. And the truth is, I thought it set us up well for Ibrox on Sunday. Uh, I, I was quite enthusiastic um, and I thought that we would go and that our dynamism and our attacking play uh, would deal them a blow uh, to, the, to the extent that they couldn't handle it. Um, now, we had a new signing, a right back playing at a left back position. I thought he was a plus. I thought he showed quality, the, the, the Croatian international. He, he showed quality. But the truth is, Frank, as you say, that chance in the first half is squared brilliantly made. A bad, a, what, a, what a pass. Uh, uh, Kyogo, great first time, didn't even touch, give a first time but right across. And you, every day of the week you're saying, Eddie's going to score here. And of course, he misses it, really poorly misses it. And I think that affected his, his whole performance, by the way, after that. He didn't recover the way you did against Aberdeen. Yeah. His head went down. Yeah. Uh, and the, the truth was, he was like a man shot. But I think I think if you're a player and you're playing for a club and you know you're you're going to be transferred soon. You're not going to give your hundred um, percent, and I think Edward was looking at all the money that he was going to get uh, off his next uh, deal. And um, and for me, he was a player of pure magic last year, a, a great player. But I think he's lost that magic. Mm. So I do. Well, he, to miss that goal, the way he done, and to play the way he done, and right after it, the manager said, I shouldn't have played him up front, I should have played Kyogo, says it all for me. There's two, two things there in what you've said, Frank. Number one is, um, Eddie, in my opinion, gave us four years and some brilliant memories. Oh, the, 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 to me, the guy on his game is a, an absolute phenomenon. I, I, I hope he goes down and rediscovers the forum that we saw in his first two seasons. Last season, I thought, like everyone in the Celtic team, he, he was off the boil, and yet he still finished a top goal scorer. Um, however, he has got potential, I think, to be world class. And, and depending on what happens at Crystal Palace, whether they bring out that potential, hopefully they'll love him, the fans will love him. I think they're going to adopt I Want to Be Edward as the song. Fantastic. Uh, Palace fans, if they give him the love, I think they'll get back from him uh, brilliant performances and he can, he can win games. However, um, you've got him playing poorly and you also had Christy, Ryan Christy. I mean, I, 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 recently on this podcast, I was saying, you know, go all out and, and get him a new contract. The way he played on Sunday, it was terrible. You've got to remember, these players know they're going to different clubs no. after the game. And uh, it's very, very, they don't want to get injured. Um, if they're going to go to another club, and they know everything's happening. Um, so they will not be putting, I'm not saying they're not trying, but they won't be putting, they'll not be going for a tackle that could maybe hurt them seriously. And then there's no transfer, there's no money, there's no wages. £75,000 a week he's getting, Edward is getting just under £4 million a year. It's unbelievable. When I went to Celtic, I was getting, they gave me £300 a week, less tax and insurance, 
£200 a week. My mortgage was £350 and I was left with about £30, £40 spare every week. These guys can buy a flat in Glasgow every week with their wages. It's unbelievable. So they've got that in their minds. So if I'm going out to a football park and I know I'm going to make £4 million next year, am I going to give my all? It's a no, bigger, I'm not. It's a bigger debate, Frank, you know, because see, in your day, um, relatively speaking, you were better paid than, than ordinary workers, right? There's no doubt about that, relatively speaking. Mm. But you know what? The gap wasn't as big. No, was Nowadays, the gap is, it's, it's immoral in my opinion. When I, went to, when I went to Celtic in 1980, um, Bobby Lennox, I played with Bobby Lennox, who was my hero because I wanted to play the same way as he done. Get behind defenders, just the way Kyogo is doing just now. I love Kyogo. He's going behind defenders, he's chasing back. I love all that. And Bobby Lennox was on £80 a week at Celtic in 1980. A Lisbon line, a disgrace. That's, listen, there, there, there's no defending that whatsoever. The point I'm trying to make is, from a societal point of view, in those days, I think Celtic players, football players in general, were more in common with the ordinary working man and woman than they are today. Today, oh, yeah, today, today they're automatic millionaires. Uh, and I, I, I find it whole. I find the whole thing distasteful. You've talked about uh, Eddie uh, getting a, a wage, a, a, allegedly of seventy-five thousand pounds a week, week. which uh, you, <laughs> you compare it to a, 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 a trained nurse, you compare it to a oh. doctor, you, com you compare it to, to people who are saving lives for a living, and, and it's absolutely obscene. But then you go to the, you know, Ronaldo's gone to Man United. Four hundred and eighty thousand pounds a week. That's it. Four hundred and almost half a million pounds a week, mate. I mean, that to me, I, I sometimes feel guilty as a socialist, Frank. I sometimes feel guilty loving the game of football because it is totally and utterly immoral. The the level of rewards. But if if the fans want to pay all that money, I would rather see it going to the players than the directors, which has happened for the last 100 years. Greed just now is a big problem in football. When I played football, greed wasn't even in it, except from maybe the directors having a wee bit more than what they should. But the players, when I played at my time, they never played football for the money. They played for the fans, and the fans reacted, and it was a magical time. People say to me, you wish you were playing just now, Frank? Um, no. I played at the right time. I played when Celtic and Rangers games would be a third Rangers supporters at Celtic Park and two thirds Celtic supporters. Now they want the whole stadium just to be the one support. That is a complete and utter nonsense. Something's worked for over a hundred years and they want to change it. Why? Great point, uh, Frank. I mean, I, I, I found myself watching that game on, on Sunday um, and it's on the back of swift action from Rangers in relation to the racism against Kyogo and the suspension of a supporters bus from, from East Kilbride, all of which was applauded quite rightly. But then the, the game's no started and already they're up to their knees in Fenian blood and it's a stadium full of only Rangers uh, fans. And you say to yourself, come on, get on the tannoid. Say to these fans, listen, this isn't acceptable. We're now in the 21st century. You can't be... Just a cauldron of hate. You can't be a, a cathedral of bigotry. Uh, and then later in the game, Frank, uh, late, later in the day, you find that they actually had a march through Glasgow. You probably haven't seen it because you know it's as of fair with social media. They had a march through uh, the centre of Glasgow um, singing It's Time to Go Home, the famine song, anti-Irish racism. And when we had the uh, anti uh, the racism against Kyogo, it was called out very good. I'm afraid the media is not as quick to call it the anti-Irish racism. And that's a sour point, Frank. We, we have, we have, we've got a football podcast and therefore we're here to talk football. But sometimes there are issues which are big enough in society that need to be called out. No more sitting at the back of the bus and keeping their mouth shut. No more sweeping these things under the carpet. Anti-Irish racism has to be called out as far as I, I'm concerned. Oh, so oh. I, I don't want to drag you into it, mate, because I think... you know, I, I'm probably more on my, my um, 
political uh, hunches with this one the, the, the new and I don't you're here to talk more and more about, about the football so I, I'm not one to put you in a position however the goal people were blaming Starfelt as far as I'm no. concerned I've watched it over and over and over again surely it's Welsh that, that was, was was nominated to pick up uh, Hollander and what he's done you can see him as soon as the move starts he, he's, he's let him go he's not got close to him and then Hollander's done well. Hollander makes a wee, a wee move to the front and Welsh goes to the front. Hollander nips around the back because he knows the ball's coming long and he loses Welsh. It wasn't even Starfield's fault. I, don't, I thought the Celtic um, in the game defended well. That was a, a brilliant goal by Rangers uh, to header that ball in because I thought it was well defended. Great delivery. Great delivery and... And it was a great header, so I think Rangers deserved that. It was a very good goal. But Celtic had their chances. Edward had a much easier chance to put the ball in the net. He never done so. And Kyogo made a... I don't like to say anything negative about him, but he should have squared the ball for Christie, was it? And that would have been a tap-in. Uh, but he never done that. So Rangers, I thought the game was very even, but I thought Celtic finished the stronger uh, in that. Uh, and that was good. You want to remember last year, Rangers were hammering Celtic with four goals and things like that. One goal and Celtic, for me, were just as good as Rangers. And that was a big, big... Because I was very worried about the game that Rangers might beat them 2 or 3 nothing, But that never happened. And it was a very, very even game. That will give Celtic... Um, the, the, the players will be like, ah, we can win the, we'll win the How refreshing, game. but how refreshing was it Frank, to have a manager after the game um, say to the fans, "Listen, in retrospect, I made a mistake. I, I, I should have, I should have played Kogo through the middle." Uh, and then he goes on to explain what was behind his thinking. I was left short because Forrest wasn't fit. I didn't have enough cover wide left. Therefore, I, I started with Kogo wide left. I, I, I'm just. I just say to myself, listen, you know, we're human beings, we all make mistakes, there's no, no doubt about that. But for him to come out and put his hand up like that and show respect for the fans, we're all watching that. We all know that Kogo should have played through the middle. He, he, he went there in 70 minutes and he nearly scored three goals. You know, he, he got into the position three times. Uh, he, he, he won the keeper, great save. Another, the keeper had the save with his feet. And then the other, unfortunately, should have shot and he, and he squared it. He could have scored the hat trick. 20 minutes there. Aye. But Kyogo, what he's got, uh, I don't see other other centre-forwards. I look at centre-forwards very closely. And what he's got, he goes shallow. When he's making his run, he goes in a shallow run so he can't be offside. And as soon as the ball's kicked in behind them, he then makes a move. And no defender can do anything about that. I've done that all my life. Um, I learned it from watching Bobby Lennox and Stevie Chalmers. I, and I used to, I remember the Voice of Adina game, I went to the Voice of Adina, and then I was like that, after the game, I said, this is magic, this place, Parkhead, all these fans. I said, I wouldn't mind being a Celtic player. You know, I was kidding myself on at the time, because I was a nothing um, in football, and uh, I said, I wouldn't mind playing for Celtic. And Were you playing football at that time? What I, age were I you played, I, was, I stayed in Easter House. Now, if you wanted to play football in the world, the, the three best places in the world to play football was Drum Chapel, Castle Milk and Easter House because we played every single day. Playtime, we used to run down to the park, play football and we used to come home and get our dinner and go out the back and play a game of football. We played football. I played football on a Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, a Sunday and then I played a wee game of football after the game we played on a Sunday at, at home. And we just played football morning, noon and night. And that's why we had great players in the 70s and the 80s. Because everybody played football. And do you know something? They all played it and it didn't cost any money. The council are now taking all the money they can off these young boys uh, to make money. And I think that's a disgrace. The only point of contention I've got with you, mate, is you missed out Pollock. Now, 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 we used to go and play against Easter Craigs, which was a big team in Easter House at the time. Very, very Pollock big. Pollock United, and we used to beat Easter Craigs. So right. 
Let's get it right. Pollock was great for the football as well. Pollock was great. <laughs> what I'm trying to say to you, I know, all the okay. schemes exactly. were great for exactly. football because gra- everybody, all the English scouts came to Scotland all the time to get players. Kenny Douglas, Joe Jordan, Andy Gray, myself went down to Liverpool. Um, it was just continuous and they sent all the scouts up to Scotland to get players because they knew if they had two Scottish players in, they've got a good chance of winning things because we had the will to win. Definitely. You've got a manager now. I don't know if you managed to see the show and I don't, you know, so often I'll get criticisms of uh, Sky for some of their coverage, but I'm going to be um, magnanimous here and I'm, I'm, I'm going to congratulate them because I thought their show um, their video about Ange Postacoglu before the, the, the game on Sunday was outstanding. Uh, uh, and I thought, I found it so moving. Um, the, the, the guy was explaining just how difficult it was to go to a foreign country. He, he talked about being on a boat for uh, something like two days, uh, travelling uh, as a young kid. Um, and then he also talked about how his, his mum and dad um, couldn't speak uh, English, they, they, they were Greek. Uh, they had to work every hour that uh, was sent. They had to do everything for, for the family, for him and his sister. And that, to me, showed that this guy has came out of adversity and is now the man that he is because of that. His character's shaped by that. And he never forgets where he came from. He never forgets the commitment to his parents. I loved it. I thought it was brilliant and it endeared me even more to this man. Um, I, I, and when he then comes out after a game and... and acts so honestly and says, hand up, I, I've got to admit, in retrospect, I should have played Kyogo through the middle. I just hope no Celtic fan slates him for that because to me, that's what I want. I want integrity and honesty from, from my manager. Yes, I want him to know what he's doing and I, I, quite clearly he knows what he's doing. But that was, was something of respect and I think we emerged from that game um, with respect still intact to Frank. In fact, we finished the game on the front foot it's not as if uh, we were under the cosh. We were pushing for the equaliser and it could quite easily, in another day, we could have scored two or three. You've got to remember, this manager has came to a club that imploded. Now, if you implode, that's the worst thing that can happen to a club. And the directors and the owner, they were nowhere to be seen. And he's came in and he sorted all that. Now, people are saying, oh, two, two Lewis's were in the next round in Europe. And we, we finished stronger against Rangers. I'm very positive. You, you know, you're, that's a great thing. I'm completely half full with that class. I'm excited because this guy, he needs about two or three years to sort everything. And what he's doing just now in the transfer window, he's brought in all the players that he wants, that he know have got the right attitude, will give 100%. Not like some of the players in the last few years have not given their all. And he knows that these players will give Celtic, they're all, and I'm really looking forward to a good period in Celtic's history. Frank, let's, let's go to that. The, the, the transfer window slammed shut last night, and I want to discuss glass half full or glass half empty as far as our transfer window is concerned. We've lost key players. We've lost Eddie, who... I'm we, not we, pro- I've not got a problem about losing Edward. Um, I happy think Celtic right. get the money in. I don't think he was the same player. He's a magical player. I love watching his magic, but I don't love watching him missing sitters and not playing well and maybe not giving 100% as well. I don't like that, but he's been... And he's made... I think he's made... Celtic money, has it? Well, he was, according to the reports on Sky and transfer uh, programme, and obviously I, everything we're saying here has got to be taken by a pinch of salt because we are relying on other people's reports. So I don't know for sure, but they're, they're saying that 18.5 million was the transfer fee. Uh, now, Celtic therefore get their 9 million back. So that's you know, we've not lost a penny on, on, on him. And then the remainder, the other nine and a half million, 40% of that apparently goes to PSG. Um, so you're getting roughly another six million in top of that. So it's a net gain of, of six million. You look at Ayer, who in my opinion has been a mainstay of the Celtic defence over the, the last four or five seasons. I, I liked the guy. I thought he was a great potential. However... 
He's away um, to um, uh, Brentford and again, mixed reports, but I, I'm reading that the, the, the fee was actually around £17 million, uh, pounds, uh, which was fantastic. Celtic spent less than a million on him, so fantastic. If you add in Frimpong uh, earlier in, in the year, if you look at getting £3.5 million back for Kamala, I, I think we got about £1 million for uh, Bio. If you look at and add it all up, uh, Henry, they, 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 they apparently got um, the, the two million back, 1.75, and they're going to get a cut of his fee. Uh, Christie, uh, according to Sky, they're saying they get two and a half million. It's about £50 million in 2021, Celtic have taken in in transfer fees. And that's the only point I'm going to make to you in relation to the 12 signings. Ten of them are permanent, two of them are loans with a, an option to buy. Twelve new players have been brought in. But do you know what? I estimate that we've spent less than 20 million. <laughs> so somewhere along the lane, I'm saying to myself, where, where is the big names? Where, where was the big statement? A, a, a sort of a clear quality signing that was maybe going to... You know, Eddie, Eddie cost us nine million when we bought him. We've not really brought any of that in yet, and and I'm maybe a wee bit worried. Kyogo, how much did he? How much they spend in Kyogo? They, they reckon about four, four and a half. Four, he's worth twenty million pound today. Okay, yeah, well, he's yeah. worth twenty million pound. So Celtic have done well with a lot of their transfers um, and made good money out of it. And what I'm happy about just now is they've gave the manager the money to go and get the players he wants. Now, you know, the directors can't say, oh, he's a good player, bring him in. That's, the directors should have nothing to do. They don't know anything about football. They know about business and how to make money, and they're very, very good at that. Um, but they should leave all the transfer dealings to the manager. Um, and he, already he's shown that he knows a player. And I, I just love this guy. And the way I love his honesty, uh, and, and that's great. And the fans love it because... They know he's not trying to take, take the mic out of him, um, and the fans love him. Uh, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I, I love him as well, well um, and I think he's a great manager. There's no, there's no. Uh, I tell you what, I, I want to give a wee shout out here because um, you're talking about loving uh, Ange Postecoglou. Um, I, I'm very, very fond of the guy already, don't know the guy, <laughs> but, but what I've learned about him has made me be very, very... Uh, uh, respectful of him and, and have great admiration for him. I do want to give a wee quick shout out to Frank, if you don't mind, to a, a special group who are doing something which I think is so um, needed and so necessary. Um, it's the Willie Mealy Memorial Group. Willie Mealy, as we know, was Celtic's first manager, managed for over nearly 50 years, was Celtic's most successful manager. Um, and had a philosophy, his philosophy, because up until he, when he became the manager, uh, when Celtic were first founded, they, they thought the best way to success was to buy players. Um, and he changed the philosophy. He said, we're going to develop our own players. And he, he invested a lot of time and energy in, in the, the, the school and, and bringing in people. And he also was very bought in very much to the whole idea of Celtic being a, a charitable institution that was there to support others. Um, and the Willie Mealy Memorial Group, based in Newry, where Willie Mealy was born, are funding enough money to build a statue to him in Newry, where he was born. They're already halfway to raising the money, but they require more public support. And therefore, I want to give a, a shout out in, in the podcast to the Willie Mealy Memorial Group. Please, Celtic supporters, go online, look up the Willie Mealy Memorial Group, and give a wee donation. Give a donation so that we can have a statue, a brilliant statue in Newry to Celtic's first and most successful football manager, Wally Mealy. I hope you don't mind me um, doing that wee bit. Thing. I think that, that thing that was brilliant, uh, you bringing that in, uh, it just shows, you know, the Celtic fans are extremely kind people and I'm sure that they will put some money in there. Okay, let, let's finish up today, Frank, with a, a, a discussion around some of these players. We, we, we don't know enough about them. I, I think we saw uh, during the Rangers game enough to tell us that the Josip Juranovic from Croatia looks quality. Uh, this is a Croatian uh, full international, regular player for Croatia. 
He plays right back for them. He plays right back for he, he, he's, for Legia, Warsaw, uh, but he played left back against uh, uh, Rangers, and he didn't look out of place. I mean, he's he's quality in it. He's going. To, he's a good addition. If you can come in and just you know these guys, people forget they're coming. You know the 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 signings for Kyogo. You know the CEO went over to to. to to Japan, wherever it was, he went and he done all that in secret and never said to anybody and brought him back. These are fantastic signings and they're doing it all quietly, going about doing their business the way that they should be doing it. And I think once once um, he gets all his players in, he'll be able to mould them into a team and that's what Jock Steen done. He came in 1965 and they said to the Celtic directors, if I'm not in Full control of the players coming in or out. I don't want the job. He was given the job immediately. Two years later, they are the European champions. Every picture tells a story. Brilliant. I think there is a wee bit of an element where Ange may be teasing us a wee bit here and challenging us with pronunciations. Because he's brought, he's brought in Kyogo. Um, he's brought in... Yura Zide or Yura Zide, um, who's the, the, the black fella for... Who was that again? He, he, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Sheffield Wednesday, black uh, defender, looks the part, but hasn't he played any part really in the competitive games? He played in some of the pre-season games. Uh, very, looks very able, um, very mobile, but maybe no as good on the ball, um, and therefore he's been on the bench for, for a lot of the games, but he's been, been brought in. Um, and now they've signed, uh, and I'm going to call him Georgius, Georgius, uh, Greek, because I'm not sure about how to say his second name, which sounds like Klakakomis. And, and I'll, well, there you go. You, have you, you take a course in Greek? Yeah, I'm just <laughs> copying you there, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got a problem in some respects with the, the second name, but let's just call him Georgius, and let's just hope George. he's is is as successful as the other big Georgius that we had, uh, big big uh, uh, big Samara. So, um, uh, from my point of view, this is the guy who played with VV Venklo in the uh, Dutch first division, and out of thirty one appearances, I think he scored twenty six goals. Oh, finished the, finished the top goal scorer in the Dutch league. Unfortunately, his team got relegated. Now, to me, that shows that he's scoring in a team that's losing, but he's scoring 26 goals. Apparently, six foot one. Uh, I've watched some of his uh, his videos online. He seems to be able to score uh, in any position, uh, outside and inside the box, but mostly inside the box. And the beautiful thing is, Frank, he's scored quite a few with the head. That's good. Because we've, we've, we've lacked that and, and, and having a bit of a presence in there, having a six foot one forward, giving defences a bit of a problem at set pieces. That's one thing that I, I was never given praise for, my head and ability. Um, and I scored a lot of great goals with my head, cultivating in the 1985 Cup final, where I don't know how that ball went in. <laughs> Um, but I was immediately <laughs> sacked after the game. Well, this is uh, listen. I want to, I want to finish the show the day. I want to finish the show with this wee story, right? Because I, I we've you and I have discussed it before, but I, I think it's worthy of, of of hearing it again. And that is that you, you go to that final um, and uh, you've been playing well all season. Uh, the truth is that the the club wasn't doing well that season because th this was the only tournament that, that you were going to win and. David Hay, the manager at the time, probably was under a lot of pressure because he suddenly produced uh, in terms of the championship. Scottish Cup final, um, it could have went either way. Uh, Dundee United, good team at the time. Dundee United were 13th in Europe at the time. 13th in Europe at the time. A great defence, David Neary, Brilliant Paul Hegarty, fantastic defenders. Uh, Ralph Mullen, what a bloody pain he was in the arse. That's why in the Dundee United were 13th or 14th in because Europe at the time. Because of them. They were getting into the semi-final of Champions League. Yes. They've got a, bet, a better record against Barcelona than what Barcelona have got against Dundee United. Probably the only team in Europe to have that. Right. In incredible football in the 80s. And you get to the final. Talk me through how the winning goal was scored well in the first place I was sub 
for the game the week before, but I'd done well in the Scottish Cup that year. I, I, uh, David Hay, I scored quite a lot of goals. I was subbed quite a lot. He wanted to play Brian McClare and Mo Johnson up front. And um, so but I was scoring a lot of goals. I scored 22 goals that season. Mo Johnson scored 23. Brian McClare scored 24. And I, I'd, I'd only played half the games that they played. So I was really the top goal scorer. Goals per minute, you're the top goal scorer. So, and I think if you score a goal every two games, that's a bit right for a centre forward. But anyway, uh, Davy Hay went down to Seamill that weekend. Oh, it was great. I, I wasn't playing in the game. I knew that. And uh, and that was that. And uh, and then Davy Hay went into the toilet and I couldn't believe uh, Davy Hay came in behind me and we said, Frank, you're playing on Saturday. Uh, you know, I, I went into the toilet and I nearly shut myself in the <laughs> toilet. So, is, this, is this the Thursday? Or this is the Thursday. Well Thursday. done. You, you knew that. <laughs> so I was like, I was like to go up to my bed and lie down for half an hour. I'm going, oh, I'm playing, brilliant. So I got myself ready and um, Billy McNeil was commentating that day and uh, Archie McPherson asked him, who do you think could be the, the, the man? He said, I think Frank McGarvey. Seriously? Always does, he always does. Very good. If you listen to commentary, he said that he always does well in the big games for Celtic. And I thought that was very nice of him. And we've been, I've been very friendly with Billy McNeil right to the end. And a lovely, lovely man. But anyway, um, I, scored, I scored the winner with the most incredible header ever. Ever. I can't probably. believe it. It was almost as if you'd put your head at the back of your uh, body and then pulled it forward. <laughs> but David Proven, he hit the free kick, which went about a millimetre inside the post. <laughs> but the two years went up to the Grosvenor Hotel after the game, and uh, after the game, all the players' wives cuddled me to, to say, well done. They weren't doing that because or they liked me or anything. They were doing that because we, we got a £2,000 bonus, and that meant that all the players <laughs> were going on holiday that I summer. I thought it was your charm and your good looks, that's why no, they were no, cuddling no. you. No, 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 they were like that. Thanks, we're going, <laughs> we're going to Benidorm, thanks. <laughs> and we had to win, we had to win at that time. Uh, a trophy of some sort to get a good bonus to pay for our holidays. Right. And I know you might think that's strange. That's the way it that's was. That's the way it was. But okay. anyway. Um, How long ago? I can't try to remember because I remember David. David problem was about 10 minutes and I was about 3 minutes. Yeah. And uh, the timing and the Celtic fans that day were. There was a hundred and over, well over a hundred thousand people at the, the game that day. It was truly amazing. And so I went in, I said, well, good time to get a new contract. The contract was up. I said, I'll go in and see David hey, on Monday morning, get a new contract and finish my time with Celtic. And I went up to see David and I was so, and he gave me a cuddle. Actually, his wife, his wife gave me a cuddle and everything. So I said, I'm right in here. I'll go in, get a transfer, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'll get him in a good mood and, I'll, you know, I'll do well with it. And uh, I went in, I said, David, he said, that was Great goal, Frank, Saturday. I said, I know. He said, I think you saved my bacon as well. I said, well, I know I did, <laughs> you know. Because <laughs> he would have been sacked if he right. never won. So I've saved him for getting the... I've saved David for getting sacked. Um, so I went in to see him and uh, I said, I'm in for a new contract, David. And uh, he gave me a cuddle for scoring the goal and that was good. And I said, oh, I'm going to get some contract here. And uh, I said to David, I said, uh, I'm in for a new contract. He said, well... Frank, he said, I'm looking to play Brian McClare up front. I said, that's no problem. I'll play with Brian. The two years going great. And uh, he said, no, I want Mo Johnson to play um, with him. I said, well, I'll be sub, no problem. And I'll keep the two of them on their toes. Don't worry about that. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was just wanting, you know, I didn't Same. have to play. I just wanted to, it was a great time. And I was on a, on a high still uh, for, for scoring that goal and all the the Celtic fans were brilliant to me. Um, I didn't have to buy a drink in a pub for about six months. Um, <laughs> it was brilliant. And uh, and then he said, well, I said, well, play the two up front. He said, no, but uh, I said, I'll be sub and I'll keep them going. He said, well, I want Alan McInally to be sub. I said, Alan, I said, I've just scored the one in the cup final. I said, he, why is he not playing Saturday now? Um, you dropped me. And he could, David couldn't explain it. And then I said, so... So you want me in the second? I said, why, why you want me in the second team? He said, because I've not got a third team. 
<laughs> no, you never see that. That was a joke. That was a joke. You made that one up. Ah, that was a joke. But I, I, I would, I wouldn't have been surprised if he did say that. So, um, I went home and uh, I was shattered, absolutely yeah, shattered. You would be. You would be. Um, the Celtic. But do you know something? It's helped me in my life because I left Celtic at the right time. You always leave a club at the top, and I left Celtic when I was up there. Right. And I. I thank David for that. I went to St Martin. Everybody said, everybody said, you'll no won any more trophies. I went on to win the Scottish Cup with St Martin. And the most important trophy I won after that was the one at Clyde where we won the second division. And that made me the only player in Scottish football to win the, the Premier League, first division, second division, Scottish Cup, League Cup. And that made me a piece of history, which I'm very proud of. Brilliant. Frank McGarvey is a Celtic legend. You've uh, been listening to the Celtic Minded podcast. I'm Frank and he's Tommy. Thanks for listening. I hope you've appreciated the contribution that Frank's given today and the contribution he gave to Celtic over five seasons and then went on to give to Clyde. Remember what he said. For Celtic fans, this glass isn't half empty. It's half full. Hail, hail.